All right, you guys, before we get into this episode of Little Man Big Conversations, just want to talk to you guys about today's sponsor. I know it's crazy. I've literally started this podcast and I already have a sponsor. Bizarre, right? Anyway, I'm going to read the copy here. Hey, are you guys lacking in. <laughs> You're not alone. A lot of people out there really suffer from. <laughs> so. If you're one of the people that suffer from this or are lacking this, then why don't you subscribe and why don't you pick up a copy of him today? It'll change your life. That's right. Don't forget, it's Write that down. It's And make sure to use the code at checkout for send off. Enjoy today's episode. Okay, welcome to the first episode of Little Man Big Conversations. I am, well, I guess I'm the little man. (laughs) I am, uh, my name is Little James, but I'm also referred to as Flash or Flash Man. But my legal first name is James. Now, the reason I'm making this podcast is because I've always been told by people, hey, you should have a podcast. Hey, man, you've got great conversational skills. You should really do a podcast. Hey, you have gifted the gab. You should do a podcast. Hey, get off my lawn. I've been told many things, and I've decided that during this strange time in our world, essentially, that I'll um, do a podcast. But of course, you're tuning in now, and if you are, and you're hearing this right now, thank you. Thank you so much. You look great. You smell wonderful. And I really like what you've done with your eyebrows. If you're a guy, then that stands as well. I don't know. Um, But of course, the first episode, I want to make it about getting to know who I am. Because otherwise, then we have no familiarity here. And you're essentially listening to hosts that you have no idea who they're about. Um, And what the hell does Big Conversations mean? So Little Man Big Conversations, we'll break it down from the start. Little Man Big Conversations is essentially a concept of Little Man big world, little man, big opportunities, you know, it's just a play on words, but the big conversation part of things is I'm going to deep dive into not only my life, but I'm going to get people on here that have played a role in my life and deep dive with them so that you, the listener, can learn about their journeys and their stories, because I've met some crazy kooky people in my lifetime, my short lifetime thus far, I should say, but a lot of people have traveled down very interesting journeys to get to their respective fields that they're in now and it's interesting to hear their individual tales of how they got there what they went through and maybe connect with you the listener on some way if you're going through a tough time or if you're going through something in the business world that you're struggling with or maybe you just want to find out hey how did this person get to that area and what did they go through and maybe that's something I'd like to try then hopefully this podcast is for you so it's all about perceptions it's all about getting to know people and it's all about people's journeys and hence the big conversation and me the little man speaking of the little man I guess I should get straight down to the point and talk to you about who the hell I am so my name as I said before is James um I'm referred to as little James because that nickname came uh when I was in high school when I was in high school in 2003 I had a one of my best friends at the time was a guy named Sam. Now Sam had two brothers and a sister. His brothers were William, his sister was Sarah, and his other brother was James. Now one day he was on the phone to me and his dad said, Who are you on the phone to? And he replied, James. And his dad said, Which James? To which he then replies, Little James. And ever since then, it just kind of stuck. I've had that nickname now for pretty much 16 years. Don't worry, ladies, it's only a height thing. <laughs> that was creepy. Uh, <laughs> I'm wanted and arrested in three states now. So that's how the nickname eventuated. It, it started from just my friend referencing to the fact that his brother was tall and I was shorter. 
And it just kind of stuck from there. Everyone just called me it. Everyone, sometimes they call me LJ, for sh- uh, ironically for short. But that's how the mantra stuck. Um, the reason for the other names, Flash, is that is my wrestling persona. Yes, you heard that correctly. My pro wrestling persona. I have been involved in independent pro wrestling now for 12 years. I started in 2008, and it's been a wonderful ride. I've, I've traveled many roads, met many people, entertained dozens of fans. No, <laughs> entertained multiple amounts of fans at different venues all across this great country of ours, Australia, and it's been an absolute blasty blast. But I will deep dive into the wrestling, maybe in episode two, like I'll do a full, give you a full rundown on how I came into that world and all the tr- ups and all the downs and all the trials and tribulations involved in independent pro wrestling that I have been through. But today it's just getting to know me. So I guess people are wondering out there, hey, well, how short is this guy? Well, I'm about four foot ten. Now, the reason I... I am short, is it's not dwarfism, it's not some sort of weird stuck in the laundry machine and put it on power blast and happen to get caught up in the washing and the OMO and the heat and the hot water shrunk me. <laughs> nothing nothing that strange. It's uh it's actually a lot uh it's a lot uh, more intense than that comedic and somewhat <laughs> horrifying washing machine incident. When uh when I was born, I was actually a chubby baby <laughs> for for my uh, for my birth. But at age two, um, I was diagnosed with stage four neuroblastoma cancer. So that's pretty. That's a pretty rough start. And that's it. Good night. No, um, <laughs> it, it's a it's a pretty rough start. It's not something that you could ever really wish upon anyone. Uh, Cancer in any way, shape or form is something that I don't think anyone should ever have to go through. And to go through that at such a young age, age two, is quite intense, to put it lightly. For those that aren't aware, neuroblastoma is the most common cancer in babies and the third most common cancer in children after leukemia and brain cancer. Yeah, so it's pretty common in terms of high risk, which I guess cancer is high risk, but there's various stages to a cancer. So being stage four, that's pretty high. In terms of high risk, chances of long-term survival are less than 40%. So I'm sitting here now at age 30, 28 years later after being diagnosed and going through treatment, surviving a percentage rate of less than 40. And here I am now in your ears. Hello. Again, creepy. But I've, (laughs) um, yeah, 40% was the max survival rate they gave me. And I'm very humbled to be here today and uh, very thankful that I'm coming to you to speak to you uh, today on the spot. And I'm very humbled to, to be able to speak to you today and have a little bit of a in-depth conversation. So yeah, it's uh, it was a pretty intense start. So I was two years old, and my mom retells the tale of having this dream or this vision of me at daycare in a white singlet, and I think it was blue and white striped shorts, and I was surrounded by the kindergarten or after-school care assistants, and I wouldn't stop crying. And they didn't know how to make me stop crying. I was, like, screaming, crying in pain. And she just remembers that image vividly. And this was a couple of months before my tumour and had developed and ultimately the cancer was created. And sure enough, a couple of months later, she gets a call from the kindergarten, James is crying, and we don't know how to make him stop. She turns up and she experiences her vision live. She sees me wearing exactly the same clothes, surrounded by exactly the same people, and having the exact same conversation that she had witnessed in her vision. So very, very bizarre. The tumour itself 
It's actually, neuroblastoma is a nerve tissue-based cancer. Um, I think leukemia is blood and brain cancer is pretty much self-explanatory. It's a knee cancer. No, it's obviously brain cancer and all of all of the cancer is, is – I think cancer in children should just be – it shouldn't be a thing. The fact that it is is just beyond belief. But neuroblastoma is a type that affects the nerve tissue. So my version of neuroblastoma started on my left kidney and it grew, 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 grew. It eventually broke out of its own tumor sac – um, which is just insane. The, the fact that it can break out of its own tumor sac is quite, yeah, it's quite intense. Um, so it broke out of its own tumor sac. It wrapped around my left kidney, spread across my stomach, up towards my ribs and down towards my knee. Now you got to remember, I'm two years old at this point. So this thing was like a massive basketball in a two-year-old. So... I believe the treatment at the time that they were giving the children that were suffering from all various types of cancer, they were giving the children treatment uh, administered on a Monday. By Wednesday, the kids would be up, you know, jumping up and down, running around, you know, coloring in, laughing, giggling. It was almost like a complete recovery. Now, you could think about that. 48 hours later after treatment, you're looking like you've completely recovered from cancer. 48 hours. That's, I wish that was a thing. The doctors would come in and say, this is, you know, this is absolutely beyond belief, quite literally beyond belief. Uh, well, look, if, if your child's okay by Friday, I mean, I mean, we can go home. We can pretty much call this remission. Friday morning, gone. And I don't mean gone as in, Oh, you're in a mission, go home. Gone. As in, that's it. Show's over. Because what had happened is late Thursday night, while the kid was sleeping, that cancer had built up an army. It had attacked the drug that was in the system, and it would completely wipe out the children in their sleep, and they just wouldn't wake up. It would just be peaceful, quick, and it was over. That was the treatment at the time. Now, I don't remember seeing or experiencing those kind of moments, you know, witnessing other children pass away in front of me. I can only retell what I've been told because thankfully in the grand scheme of things, I don't remember all too much about going through the initial treatment. I'm only referencing here documentation and journals and first-hand experiences from my mother and father during this time. Now, my, my mom and dad were adamant that the treatment that they were giving the kids at this time was not going to be given to me. They said, no, we've seen what that drug does, and that's not happening. We're not giving our son that. And there has to be another way. And I believe that the doctors at the time... <laughs> So you remember, this is 1991. The doctors at the time said, well, there's this other treatment that's coming out of America. It's experimental at best, but it has a survival rate of close to, I think, 30%. Now, you got to remember, the total recovery rate for neuroblastoma is 40%. And now they're telling me this treatment cuts off 10% of the overall winning margin. <laughs> so now I'm dealing with 30%. Now, 30% is a hell of a lot better than zero, yeah? So what do you do? If you're a parent and you have a two-year-old at this time, what are your options, zero or 30? Yeah, you're going to go with the 30. So they went with the zero. No, <laughs> they went with the 30, and the treatment involved nuclear radiation and chemotherapy Three times a day, every day for about, I think it was three weeks. And it was morning, noon, and night. Before I had the treatment, they would take my bone marrow out 
I would have the treatment, I would come back, they'd put my own, they'd clean it and they'd put my own bone marrow back in. So it wasn't really a transplant, it was more like a bone marrow removal, I guess, every time that I'd have these uh, these treatments. Uh, like I said before, I don't remember going through it. I have fragmented memories sometimes of, of you know, sort of like, not, not repressed, because repressed means that I've remembered it and sort of squished it down, so to be, but... I, I I only have photos and journals and retellings and obviously the documentation of all the tests that I'd had. The photos enough. The photos are enough for me to see the amount of wires and read the amount of operations that I'd had. Yeah, I wouldn't wish that upon anyone. It was also during this time that I was made aware that my mum had given birth to my sister. And my sister's name is Jessica. Now, to this day, I don't know where Jessica is because <sighs> the sad thing was that when Jessica was born, she was born with Down syndrome. And as you could probably understand and sympathise with, my mother could not handle a two-year-old going through cancer treatment essentially three times a day and also deal with helping support a child that essentially would, just wouldn't understand the world at that point given her uh, – I want to be I want to be polite. I don't want to use the disability because I think that's – for me, it's personal. I, I think that's a derogatory word. So I'd say given Jessica's diagnosis, so my sister – as painfully as it was, was given up for adoption. And the last time I believe I saw a photo of my sister was 1997. If she ever hears this, Jessica, hello, I'm your brother James. I love you and I hope you're doing extremely well at whatever life has given you and whatever you've decided to do. So... I think I was finally cleared and put into remission at about age five. I think that's when everything finally subsided and they went, yeah, okay, it's finally gone away. Now, that's not to say I stayed in hospital for five years. I had the treatment. I was in and out of Ronald McDonald House, which is a lovely charity that takes care of all range of sick kids. They work close hand in hand with Camp Quality, which is a sort of getaway retreat for sick kids, which is... Just make them forget about the real world and forget about their pain for a week to two weeks. And it's a lovely, a lovely organization and it's a lovely thing that they're doing there. I actually got to partake in two different types of camp quality. Um, one, I think, when I was, I want to say seven and eight. And they were great. They m make the kids do a range of activities. They bring in entertainers. They you're with a carer. And the carers were so lovely. I had two lovely carers. One made me a big book on all the different photos we'd done, all the memories that we did, uh, all the activities that happened each day of the camp. It was just so lovely. And I think I still have that book to this day. And that's where I first discovered my, uh, my admiration for the artist known as Michael Jackson. Oh, Killer music, man. Absolute, absolute legend. Um, so, yeah, that was – Chem Quality was absolutely wonderful. It made me feel like I wasn't alone. And I know, like like I said, the, the, the fathoming of not being alone going through medical illnesses is, is, you know, not to the depth that I would think about it and go into it and dive, deep dive as, as it would as a 30-year-old, but – just realizing that, hey, you know, there's kids out there that, you know, essentially as an eight-year-old thinking, yeah, there's kids out there that have been sick too and I've been sick too and we're all in this together. It was actually at Camp Quality that I created this group called the Three Amigos and it was myself, another boy named Mark and another boy named Jacob. And I have this photo on my computer of, of the three of us wearing firefighter outfits because they had these the royal firefighters come in and we were allowed to use the hose and put out this i don't know oil not oil but a drum fire thing you know the safe you know safety demos and things like that that they do um 
for pretty much schools they did for camp quality and that was a lot of fun and I, I treasure that photo because I found out that camp quality send a newsletter and I again being a young kid at the time I I used to think it was I mean looking back on it now I thought it was like an invitation to Hogwarts oh I get to go to camp quality again like that's <laughs> that's as far as I thought into these letters from camp quality I just thought they were invitations to go back to camp quality um but it was only years later that um the camp quality letters stopped coming in the mail and i always wondered why because one minute they're there and then one minute they're gone um but yes it wasn't until years later that i discovered that my mom actually had decided to not receive the newsletters anymore and i thought why you know the, Literally, the whole thing was about positivity. Like, this is what we're doing at Camp Quality, and this is how much money we raised from Ronald McDonald House, and this is all the good stuff we're doing, and yeah, 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 yeah. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's terrible. Oh, get rid of that. You know, way too much positivity. But the reason that she had said to them, don't send the newsletters out to us anymore, was because there was on the back page an obituaries. And I remember two distinct editions of the newsletter. One featured Mark and one featured Jacob. And they were listed in the obituaries. So yeah, that was um that was hard to process. So I completely understand why my mother thought it best that those uh that those newsletters stopped coming. Because when it comes back down to it, I was the only one of my ward to essentially walk out alive. Which, every time I say that sentence, is bizarre. Because that's something you you, sh- you should hear on like an action movie. Like, he's the last man alive. Like, and this is reality. This isn't a movie. I, I didn't get paid to walk away from an explosion. I wasn't going through treatment to try and get in the get in the character I'm you know I'm, I'm a I'm a method actor no this was reality so I was the last kid to walk out of that ward alive and it, it again I didn't fathom that I couldn't understand that concept as far as I knew cancer to me was like a cold oh yeah I had it I got over it what's the big deal but at about age five I was finally cleared so I was uh finally allowed to start school. So I started school in Sydney and that seemingly went normal because I was just like every other kid, really. I honestly, being a kid, I didn't think anything was wrong with me. You know, I couldn't grasp the concept of cancer and I don't know, I think my mind just sort of filtered it out like I keep referencing. So yeah, public school was pretty much normal for the most part, which is, considering the rough start I had, was a welcome change. So during school, coming up through public school and that, I would have to do uh, four, six, 12 months follow-ups. And I distinctly remember one time walking into the Royal Children's Hospital and having the nurses in the ward that I used to be in, stand up and give me a standing ovation because I was the one that made it out of that entire ward. And once again, I was a kid. I had no idea what was going on. I think I even said to them, I don't know why you're clapping. It's not my birthday. (laughs) Because at, at that point as a kid, the only thing you get clapped for is either being a part of a school production, winning a participation award, or being cheered on by your friends and family for your birthday. And I wasn't receiving an award. This wasn't a school production. So as far as I knew, I'm, I thought all of them were insane for thinking it was my birthday. But it was also during school that I discovered my love for comedy. Um, growing up in the 90s, Seinfeld was you know, massive, massive TV show. And I used to really love doing impersonations. So at one point, all the kids... I think Seinfeld was on either before or after afternoon or nighttime kids 
animation shows or something, something like that. So I impersonated Jerry Seinfeld for a bunch of kids. And I, I, I couldn't remember what. I thought it was something to do with a pen. Um, but that was where I first started really appreciating comedy and the power that comedy can – can give you making other people laugh and I just love that energy and I went wow this is addictive making other people laugh and just all sharing this experience together for x amount of time is is strangely addictive but it was also during this time that I discovered my passion and love for pro wrestling yeah it was um, it was strange. It was a strange way. Everyone's got a story about it. Now, I won't dive too much into it, but I will share with you now. And I'll recap on this in another episode, but I'll share with you now how I first witnessed wrestling. I was at my dad's place. I remember first seeing WCW, not WWF, WCW. And Goldberg was standing in the ring, and Hollywood Hulk Hogan had slid in the ring behind him with a chair, whacked him on the back. Goldberg didn't even flinch, turned around and stared at him. And, and something like 16,000 people thought it was the greatest thing in the world, all high-fiving and ranting and raving and cheering. Yeah, yeah, get him, Bill, get him, Goldberg. And I, as a kid, was watching this thinking, this must be some sort of police raid. This is some sort of riot. Where was this? Because, again, I couldn't fathom the idea of two men attacking each other and everyone cheering it. Like, what is this? And subsequently, I managed to discover that I think Channel 10 had the Fox Sports rights and they got WWF and that kind of opened up a complete other avenue of, of wrestling intake and characters and superstars that I still idolise and some of the matches and memories I still watch to this day thanks to the WWE Network. <laughs> so that's how I first discovered pro wrestling. But thankfully I did because... Uh, fast forward to 2003, I had then moved to Queensland. Now, the reason I've moved to Queensland is that essentially where I was, the winters were very cold and I was very skinny. So I was that little kid that was quite literally hugging a heater when it came winter time because it was just it was just too cold. And yeah, so it just it just got too much and it, and it really affected me because in 2000, uh, three years before I moved in 2000, I actually had to have hip surgery because I was at school one day and you know kids tuck their leg behind them and they sort of sit on their foot that that kind of you know, like some kids do that. I was simply doing that and I just felt a really big pain in my left hip. And I thought I'd just corked it or done something on, you know, running around the playground or whatever it was and I didn't think anything of it. Three days later, I couldn't put, I couldn't walk. It just felt like someone had their fist in my hip, like I couldn't put any pressure on it. It just felt, ugh, felt yuck. So we went to, uh, went to the hospital, had an emergency x-ray and they discovered that my leg joint to my hip had actually slipped behind my hip so it'd come out and, and the joint had slipped so no wonder I felt like someone was essentially fisting my hip because that's kind of what was happening except it was my leg was rubbing against the back of my hip so I had a screw put in so essentially I had to learn to walk again at age 11 which was just you know the worst thing ever at age 11 <laughs> as you can imagine so, yeah, fast forward to 2003, we decided to move because this, my screw was reacting in the cold, as you can imagine, metal in the body, skinny kid. Yeah, that's going to be cold. So I moved to a warmer climate. And thank God for Wrestling Man because when I moved, I went to a high school called Hillcrest. And Hillcrest was a Christian college, and my experiences there was mixed, but majority of it was fantastic. But... The most daunting thing you could imagine being a kid starting high school was my very first day, uh, I was put in grade nine. Now, I was originally in grade eight in high school before I moved, and I was told upon moving, oh, yes, grade eight where you are is grade nine up here. Okay, fine, whatever. So, okay, I'm being ushered around the school and shown all the the buildings and 
this this is the library, this is the canteen, you know, this typical high school facilities. And I get told, okay, well, all grade nine is meeting in the common room because we're having camp tomorrow. What? <laughs> Excuse me? I know no one. And y'all want me to go to camp tomorrow? Okay. <laughs> this is going to be fun. So my second ever day of high school in Queensland was grade nine camp. I didn't know anyone. But thank God for wrestling because the very first friend I made and subsequently, again, do it in the wrestling episode, but the guy I debuted in wrestling with, managing, was a guy named Tim. And he wrestled under the name of Blaze. Not in 2003, obviously, but <laughs> when we debuted together. And, yeah, it, and uh, I essentially came up with, what are you into? Oh, I like pro wrestling. Oh, cool, so do I. And boom, that was it. We just became friends. We, we shared our loved interest of wrestling. We did the whole, you know, doing it on, doing wrestling matches on trampolines and using pillows as chairs and tables and all sorts of weird and wonderful things. But yeah, that's how I became, that's how I made my first friend in, essentially in, in high school when I moved. And that opened the door to one of my first ever best friends that I had um, was, a, was his sister named Julianne. And Julianne and I shared wonderful moments growing up through high school together um, she was an absolute godsend. I couldn't wish for a better support and a better best friend during that time, honestly. And I know everyone says that, like, oh, I love my best friend, Ellie. XOXO. No, this was something else, man. Like, she really took care of me. And, you know, telling the medical tale that I've told you guys right now was just like, okay. And it wasn't looked at weirdly. It wasn't clearly frowned upon. It wasn't done like a, oh, yeah, he's had cancer. If I just stay away from that guy, he's a bit weird. No, she fully accepted it, didn't bother her, and was an absolute angel to me during high school. So, Julianne, if you ever hear this podcast, thank you so much. I love you for everything that you did, and I'm so happy of where you are in your life now, and I'm very, very proud of you. So, yeah, it, it opened, uh, wrestling opened a lot of avenues for me before I even got into it, which is Kind of cool, really. So, yeah, camp came and gone, and now school, high school began. <laughs> this is where the high school experience started to get really different for me because I'm sure people out there that either listen to this are either going through, have just finished, or have been through in some way, shape, or form high school. So I'm sure when I say that high school is full of mean little bratty kids, everyone goes, yep, there's a lot of brats. And I could use other colorful language, but I'm going to go with brat. Dicks. Oh, too late. <laughs> no, I'm going to stick with brats. And it got to a point where there were certain people, some that were in my grade, others that were above my grade, um, that just didn't like who I was because of my size. And I mean, when, you, when I say it like that, you think that's just really stupid to be after someone, to be targeting someone because they're shorter. Really? Like, yeah, it's, it's such a nothing thing to go after someone about. I mean, it shouldn't even be a thing. Like, no one should be going after everyone, really. But, I mean, it's high school and, you know, if you're not, if you're not looking like someone else that they like, then you're a freak, essentially. So, yeah, it kind of got rough, especially when I was told at the end of grade nine, my school came to me and said, look, we've made a mistake. And we realized that we put you in grade nine when we should have put you actually in grade eight. And although your schooling results are fine, you're going to have to do grade nine again. Now, I've just spent a year 
getting to know these people. I've just made friends that I assume at that stage I'm going to graduate with and have these friends for life. And thankfully, I still have a fragment, count on one hand list, people from that original grade nine that I still talk to to this day. But we're rewinding back the clock here and I was just crushed. What, I've got to do it all over again? And you can imagine the high school perception was, oh, he failed grade nine. They, what do you mean? Can you imagine a teenager telling another teenager, oh, nah, school made a mistake. <laughs> yeah, right. It was, that's just how it was. It was, yep, we, we, we messed up. Sorry, you're going to have to do it again. Fun part was I kept all my assignments. So <laughs> file print, eh, take three weeks off from that assignment. Thanks very much. So that was a fun fun part. <laughs> Just the, the only fun part for a while there of doing grade nine again was that I'd already done the assignments asked to be. But everything happens for a reason. And the second lot of grade nine that I was exposed to, well, that sounds weird, doesn't it? It sounds like I wasn't wearing pants or something. The second... <laughs> Yay, high school got a weird turn. The second, <laughs> it's like a chapter of grade nine. Surprise! Ooh. No, the second lot of grade nine that I was now put with were some of the greatest people that I've ever come to know. And I hope that a few of them will hear this and they'll know who they are. And I'll say to them, thank you. Thank you for being there for not letting what I went through d deter your ideology of me and for just being a friend because that's all I needed at that point. I didn't need questions. I didn't want investigations. Uh, I just wanted friends and thankfully my charisma, no, <laughs> thankfully people's perceptions of me weren't really swayed depending on what I went through because they just wanted me to be their funny a little friend, but it wasn't in a derogatory way. That's just what I was. So thank you. Thank you to anyone from Hillcrest that hears this because you guys are awesome. And comparing to where I previously was at high school and, and moving up to Queensland, you guys made high school great for me. So thank you. So it was around this time that social media was becoming a thing. Um... There was like the peer to peer networks. There was like LimeWire and FrostWire and Kazar and Napster and all sorts of viral, <laughs> virus riddled programs that plugging in your phone line into your modem and hitting dial up would just corrupt your computer within 10 seconds. But hey, man, free music, right? So MySpace became a thing. So everyone had their MySpace, everyone designed layouts, everyone could customize and do coding, and have music, and all sorts of weird and wonderful things. So yeah, MySpace became a huge thing for us, uh, for us second lot of grade nines during, um, during high school. And it was shortly thereafter that I, uh, I went through the whole emo phase. Yes, I know, the emo phase, we all look back and we go, cringe. You know, we all had lip piercings, we all had black hair, and we're all listening to screamo music because it resonates with me. Yeah, okay. Um, but, hey, at that time, it was an escape because the bullying got to me. The bullying got to me, and I decided in, I think, pretty much grade 12 that this was all getting a bit too much, that... I could feel that everyone was growing, everyone was changing, and I was still the same. And this sucked. I wanted to be taller. I wanted to be faster. I wanted to be stronger. I wanted to be bigger and better. And I wasn't. It was like my body was frozen in time. So, yeah, I dyed my hair black. I became really withdrawn. It affected me on a, on a great deal. And, you know, I went through a real hard time with that. I contemplated, you know, was it worth being here? Was it, would anyone ever understand me, let alone would everyone ever want a relationship with someone like me? Because I, I wasn't happy with who I was and I took that out on everyone else. And I admit that. I wasn't happy in my own skin 
and I blamed everyone else for it because they were happy in theirs, because their bodies were changing, because they were getting taller and faster and bigger and stronger. And little old me was the same. When in reality, I should have just accepted the fact that, hey, this is what I got, and I'm good, man. Like, I can buy the same size clothes for the rest of my life. <laughs> my shoes fit forever. You know, and there's positives to everything. I always believe in the mantra that there is always a bigger positive to a negative situation. Always. It's all about hindsight, and it's always about perspective and how you approach and adapt and overcome individual situations that plague your life. You can focus on the negative, you can be sucked up in all the darkness, and you can be swallowed whole by knowing that, oh, there is no other way, this has to be the way, I have to go through this, blah, blah. You don't have to do anything. If you let it affect you, it's affecting you. If you don't want it to affect you, then try and find, as best as you can, the positive approach to a negative situation. Sometimes they may not be, and I get that, and I'm not being ignorant of that fact, so let me be clear. Sometimes there are just bad circumstances and you just the only thing you can do to be positive is just be strong that's really all you can do there is no cheat code there is no other way about it it's just you got to stand tall you got to be strong and that's it but for me i needed to look at that positivity i needed to look at that perspective and i just didn't so i dyed my hair black i uh yeah listened to sad music and i just lived vicariously through a computer for close to a year and a half. So I pretty much graduated. When I graduated high school, uh, I think I started to come out of it. And this is true. This is all I did. It was after my grade 12 formal. I think it was like the week leading into schoolies. Yes, I went to schoolies. (laughs) And I was living with my dad at the time. And we had this grassy patch area at the front of the house. And we had a big grassy hill at the back of the house. And I remember sitting in the front lawn of the grassy patch. And it was nighttime. And it was a clear night. And I remember sitting there and I looked up at the stars. And I just simply said to myself, okay, this is what I am. This is what I've got. And I'm okay with that. I would rather be who and what I am, than pretending to be what th- what other people want me to be. And I sat there for a while. And I just it was I, I mean anyone else walked in, walked in the front yard at that point would have looked like I was some sort of deranged crack crack addict because I was just sitting there nodding and you know, yeah, yeah, agreeing and just sort of I guess invisibly swallowing this this profound retrospective that I'd now discovered upon my life. Yeah, yes, yes, uh, yeah, yes, yes, yes. Just sort of quietly nodding in the front yard. Um, but it helped. And from pretty much that point on, I was completely accepting of what I was. I didn't let anything sway me. I didn't – it didn't change me. There would always be people, and there still is to this day. I'm, I'm 30 years old now, and there are still people today in today's modern society that will whisper comments behind their glass or put their hand up in front of their mouth or, you know, do the side, you know, look at me and then turn around and talk to someone and they will look over their shoulder looking for me, and it's so obvious, you know, and I just wave. <laughs> That's how I beat them. I just wave, and they, then they get awkward. Oh, hey, uh, I mean, what are you looking at? You know, what's wrong? <laughs> Am I missing my head or something? Like, nothing's wrong. I'm just a short dude. That's all. So, yeah, I went through the emo phase, but, you know, looking back on it, there are some cringy photos. I'm sure we all have cringy emo day photos, but, yeah, that was uh, that was the broad spectrum of going through high school of how I sort of got out of that mindset and started to approach university. Now, I left deciding, like, I'll be straight up here because why not? I left deciding what to do with university till the very last week of uh, applications, and my, which also coincided with my very last week of high school. I pretty much left it till the Wednesday, and we were done by Friday. So I had no idea what I wanted to do. 
But I decided that I'd really enjoyed editing during my time at high school. I really liked cutting things together. I really liked filming things, making music videos, highlight reels, those kinds of things. I did it with the wrestling. Um, I was really into video games too, Metal Gear Solid, Kingdom Hearts. So I cut up videos to the cutscenes of those games and made little stories out of a story using music and things. I really, you know, got into it. And the same with wrestling too. Um, so I decided, hey, you know, give film and television editing a go. And that took me to university. Uh, and I studied and completed a Bachelor of Film and Television at Bond University. And again, the, the I've, I've met people there that I still talk to to this day. Some are very near and dear to me. They have been there quite literally since my university days and are still there now. And it's been fantastic. I've been very fortunate to, to meet very loyal, understanding, and downright caring people. And that's rare to find people that genuinely give a shit about you. But I'm very lucky and I'm very thankful for these people. Um, because university, going from high school to university, for those, for those that don't know, it's a completely different world. I mean, in one minute you're doing, what, six subjects a day at high school? All ranging from math, English, what, personal development, history, drama, film and television, studies of society, science, um, yeah, sport, PE. Like, there's a lot there that happens in, in one day. Plus, you got recess and lunch, which is always a drag. <laughs> <laughs> but at university, man, it's like, hey, Here's our lectures. Turn up. If you don't, that's your fault. Uh, here's the assignment. If you do it, cool. If you, if you don't, well, you're out. And here's the tutorials to help you with, to coincide with the lectures and help you with your assignments. It's up to you if you want to do them. If you do them, great. If you don't do them, well, you're out. So it was very much a, you put in the effort and the amount of effort you put in, you were rewarded. Compared to, high school which kind of had like the safety net which was you know you couldn't really essentially fail to a certain extent because I mean you could fail the class but it wasn't like a oh you have to repeat the entire year unless you're sort of bombing every semester but yeah university man completely just brought in my eyes and it was a good chance to just reinvent myself um, and that's what I did I just reinvented myself I just got to knowing the people um, I had started my pro wrestling journey at this point, so I was already living living out one dream while hopefully fulfilling another by becoming a, a film editor. So yeah, a lot of things were happening at, at, at this point in my life. Um, but the cool thing that I thought about is once I had um, about, I think once I had done the first term of university, uh, I left. No, um... I decided to go back to my high school to speak to the kids about not knowing what you want to do is okay because, like I said, I quite literally didn't know what I wanted to do until the very last week of high school. But I wanted to come back and talk to the grade that I was – that was below us, grade 11, which was now grade 12, and come back six months later and just tell them that, you know, it's 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 going to be okay. And – I was here six months ago and I'm telling you it's going to be okay because I didn't know what I want to do and I'm loving what I'm doing now. So I thought it was just a real raw seize the moment and let's do this now opportunity. But I'll be honest, I didn't go back to my high school to do that. I thought, yeah, that would be really cool to do that. But I didn't walk in those hallowed gates of Hillcrest again with that mentality. I actually went in to go and visit my old film and television teacher. You know, I filled out the visitor's pass and walk, and I was walking to the film and television room and I got stopped by the school uh, chaplain, I think it was, and we caught up and he was, you know, he's a lovely guy. He was nice to all of us and – you know, we, we got to chatting and he asked what I was doing and I you know, told him I was doing university and wrestling and and I said, where is everyone? What's happening today? And he said, oh, we've got a, we've got like this chapel, which is, 
you know, they, I think that the version of Chapel at that point, it's probably changed now, I'm going back 12 years ago, was we'd all be in this auditorium, we'd you'd sing a few Christian sort of rock and roll or songs or something like that, and they would do announcements and then sort of speeches and they'd maybe get like a guest in or something, and that was essentially chapel. So it was kind of like an assembly with mixed in with a bit of, I guess, a bit of religion. I don't know. Um, I don't want to sound like I'm making fun of it, but that's essentially what it was. So, uh, yeah, so they said, oh, we've got chapel today. I said, oh, cool. And then I sort of, as a joke, said, oh, have you got any guests today? And the chaplain was like, no, why? Do you want to talk? And I went, well, yeah, to be honest, I mean, if you don't have anyone, I, I was thinking about it earlier, but, I mean, I don't want to – I mean, how, how do you go about doing that? Is that sort of like a – do you have to organize that? Because I don't know if I could do it right now. And he goes, no, come on. So we went up to the deputy principal's office, and the deputy principal was very lovely to me, um, very understanding of, of what I went through and just very kind to, to me. Um, I know that my friends that I still have from high school had all varied experiences with him, but he was always very nice to me. So we walked in the room and he was, oh, wow, hey, James, how's it going? Shook my hand. Oh, great, great to see you, great to see you. So I sat down in his office and I said to him, he goes, oh, you know, how can I help you today? I said, well, I've just run into the chaplain here and he tells me that you guys have, have a chapel today. And he goes, yeah, yeah, we're doing it in about, you know, 45 minutes. I said, oh, great. I said, well... And a few of the wrestling guys looking at this will know this is the line I always use. And this is where it stemmed from. I looked at my deputy principal and I said, I've got an idea. <laughs> he said, oh, okay, what's your idea? I said, well, I really would like to talk to the kids about, um, you know, leaving high school and doing university. And I, I thought this would be an opportune time to come back and chat to them about what happens. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That'd be great, great. I said, cool, well, I, I, I kind of want to make it a, a bit spontaneous, though. He said, all right, what's your, what, what, you know, what have you got in mind? Now, I'll admit to this because at the time, this was awesome. And I don't care. <laughs> I don't care if it sounds cringy. It was funny as hell at the time, and it went well. So I said to him, well, what about if I hide backstage? Obviously, you know, a few kids are going to see me come in, but they won't know that, obviously, I'm part of the uh, the chapel. So we don't announce that I'm there as a guest speaker. You just say you have a guest speaker, but you don't say who it is or what it is or what's happening. Okay, okay. So, so what I'll do is I'll hide backstage. And I said at, at one point, just before I come out, I would love it if you were to grab the microphone and sort of start berating the kids by saying, you know, oh, well, you know, uh, the bell's gone, but we've still got a guest speaker here. But to be honest, after this guest sp speaker finishes talking, I think everyone should stay in after lunch and we're going to learn to be quiet because you guys have done nothing but talk during this whole – you know, completely just over the top, overreact to scare the kids and be like, what is happening? And I said, at that point, I'll have the sound desk <laughs> – again, bear with me. I'll have the sound desk play – the entrance music of WWE superstar The Rock. If you smell what The Rock is cooking, have that play. I'll come out, I'll stand on the stage, I'll snatch the microphone off you, and I'll start my speech. And straight away he was like, great, love it. Yep, let's do it. And I went, okay. So, yeah, half an hour later, we're walking down to this chapel. There's, Like I said, there was a few kids that saw me. Oh, yeah, little James, little James, hey, hey. Oh, hey, how's it going? Hey, how's it going? What are you doing? Are you, are you chapel today? Nah, man, I'm just coming to help out with film television. But I'll see you guys. If any of you guys are doing film TV, I'll see you guys later. Oh, great, great. And I went backstage and I said, um, you know, is this where all the cables are kept? And just proceeded to walk backstage, you know, complete cover. And sure enough, the chapel went and... It uh, it started, it started, and it reached that point. It reached that point, and he sold it amazingly. He got on the microphone. He was parading the kids. We're gonna stay in at lunch, and we're gonna learn how to be quiet because all you guys have done is talking. Remember, if you smell what the rock is cooking, and the kids laugh, thinking like the sound desk had mucked up. Lo and behold, I come out, and I stand there, and I look at the kids. I look at the deputy principal. I look back at the kids. And that place, not even joking, ex 
loaded. That was just nuts. I mean, they were into it straight away. They knew what was happening. They all knew I was a wrestling fan during school. So they were like, yes, we get this. This is awesome. And he's coming to save us, you know, that kind of vibe. I snatched the mic off the deputy principal and I proceeded to do this, I think, half an hour speech to the kids about um, the concept of high school, the concept of religion in high school compared to the coming out of high school, compared to like the real world's adaptation of religion, um, not knowing what you want to do, what university is like, how the whole process goes, your first orientation week. You know, I just really did like a guided yet made it funny kind of speech to these kids. And they were just 100%. They were so happy to have me back to do it. They all really appreciated it. And it was just an amazing, you know, just right place, right moment to be there to do that. And, yeah, it was uh, it was quite surreal. So fast forward a couple of years, I graduate uni and – I then am offered roles in acting. I did a few acting jobs, uh, worked on some short films, worked on some commercials. And speaking of acting, again, all ties back to wrestling, I managed to have a, quite a long long stint on Bruce 31, a.k.a. 31 Digital's very successful late night comedy show, the late night show with Scott Black, and I was his sidekick for many years, along with other various co sidekicks. Like there was two of us, a co sidekicks. I was one of two sidekicks, um, and uh, yeah, it was great. Uh, it was an absolute deep dive, ironically, into community TV, essentially film and television, and that was just a crash course in how TV studios run, what is required to make them run, and eventually the show became live on Brisbane TV. So if you had 31 Digital and you were able to get that channel at 9, 10 o'clock at night, bam, we're live. We're live! You know, it's it, and there we were. And that was surreal. But that helped so much with my stage presence, my timing. And Scott, if you ever hear this, Thank you, brother. Thank you for having me on board. Um, I know for a lot of the episodes there, I I didn't pull my weight, for lack of a better term, but that's not to say that I'm not appreciative of what you gave me. I'm very thankful, and I love you. So thank you very much, man. Thank you for, for allowing me to, to be there with you and you know, share that journey with you because I wouldn't change it for the world. And yes, to this day, Depending on where I go, people will still recognize me from that show, which is nice. You know, it's nice to that you played a big part, um, well, made a bit part, I should say, in people's lives. So that takes me to about, where are we now? That takes me to about 2013. So we've gone from 2008 to 2013. This is where things start going dark things start unraveling at the seams. But I will go into more detail in a part two. So I hope that's a good little overall um, little story, staircase journey um, to what's made me me. Uh, there's, there's been a lot more, and there will be a lot more episodes to come, but I hope so far that's that's a good hour-long introduction as to who I am. So you've kind of got a gist of, of what I went through, um, what I've been able to do thus far, and I hope you come back. I, I, I like having you here. I like, again, I really love that shirt. I will do a part two. Um, I will talk about going through the dark times. Uh, I will dive a bit more into the medical battles that I had. I will also go into relationships because, yes, even through all my illnesses and even through the fact that I thought for a long time that I wouldn't have relationships, yes, I managed to have relationships. Maybe I'll make part three about the wrestling. It's up to you. If you guys would like part two to be about wrestling, please let me know. 
on social media. Uh, you can follow me on facebook.com forward slash flashman101. Uh, on Twitter, I am run flashman run. And on Instagram, I am Brutalio. So yeah, if you want part two, hit me up on the socials. Part two can either be the wrestling or the dark times, relationships, medical, whatever. Or the other way around. And we'll also be doing some interviews. I met and s- spent time with a lot of different people in different fields. And I want you to get to know them like I know them. I want to make these interviews not only fun for me, but fun for you guys. Because what we see on TV is with certain people, especially the performers and entertainers that I've come to know, we only see the characters. I want you guys to know the person, the person behind the characters, understand their stories and have a big conversation, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, with a little man, me. So you get to learn while I get to learn, and we all get to learn together, because learning is fun, the more you know. (laughs) So again, thank you so much for joining me. I hope that you're safe and well during these crazy times, and I hope you tune in for episode two coming out real soon. Thank you again, and I'll see you down the road.